Alright, here's the deal. 2019 had a lot of fantastic games that came out, and I want to talk about them. I want to make this video short, sweet, and to the point because I couldn't just choose 10 games to talk about this time, and I've kind of spent the last few months trying to come up with a list of top 10 games that I liked, but I just couldn't. So instead of the typical 10 best games of the year shtick, I'm going to talk about, um, let's see, what do we, what, 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 what I have it written down here, um, 18. Look, I just want to do my best to keep things short and sweet, but I'm only human and a lot of how long this video will end up being is entirely dependent on if I feel like making it long or not. I'm going to talk about these in alphabetical order with special little rewards up here in the right corner, like best game of the year or whatever, because I'd rather just talk about the games themselves than focus too much on ranking them. Cool? Cool. So, stick around for the next however long and let's rap about some video games. What would you be willing to do to return to the land of the living? If your answer was that you'd try and out-party the devil himself, then After Party is probably the game for you. In After Party, you play as Milo and Lola, two lifelong friends who find themselves in hell and learn that in order to return to Earth, they have to out-drink, out-party, and out-perform undead humans, demons, and whatever the hell these things are to gain an audience with Lucifer at his never-ending party all for the chance to just regain their lost lives. The game was developed by Night School Studios, whose first game, Oxenfree, focused heavily on dialogue and player choice to bring you one of several outcomes. The game does take a lot of dark and twisted terms that I won't spoil for you here, but just know that this game will undoubtedly make you feel things and gut punch you more than once. That said, the pair of Milo and Lola are wholly realized individuals, and experiencing their journey was probably one of my favorite highlights of 2019. The game is very simple to play and easy to pick up, the dialogue options are witty and fun, the different choices for drinks that give you different dialogue options after that is even more of a nice little twist on the formula, and overall, I'm just excited to see what happens next. Not necessarily for After Party, but after Oxenfree and then now After Party, Night School Studios is probably one of my favorite independent companies. All right, I'm not gonna lie. I'm just kind of exhausted by the battle royale genre at this point. I'm probably not the only one though, but hey, that's just me. Some games have tried to make something unique and fun within the battle royale genre and everything, but the ultimate concept of X number of people drop onto an island, scavenge for supplies, and try to be the last one standing is just so tired at this point. That's not to say that these games can't still be fun, and I mean, I'm more personally likely to just play more Fortnite to justify the money I paid for the game. Apex Legends is still kind of fun, even though it didn't really hold my attention for that long. I've played this game probably three times now. Once when the game came out, once to record footage for this video, and one more time after that for posterity just so I had a better understanding of how the game played. The gameplay is actually very well executed and feels a lot like Titanfall, which makes total sense because it's the same people who made the dang thing, and the aesthetic of the game world looks like it could offer a lot of fun with quirky characters and unique situations. But as far as changing up the formula for Battle Royale, making it a hero shooter is probably a good step forward. If they were somehow able to add a little bit more into there, then maybe I'd play it some more. But as of right now, eh, I'm just gonna probably stick with Fortnite. I've always been a big fan of puzzle games, and Baba Is You has probably one of the most simple premises for a puzzle game I've ever seen. You play as Baba, a small white rabbit, and your goal is to get them from wherever they start to the finish flag. Littered around the level are simple statements like Baba Is You, Flag Is Win, Rock Is Push, that sort of thing. What makes this game unique and sometimes infuriatingly difficult is that you can change these commands around by simply pushing them. Is that wall blocking your path? Simply remove the connecting word between wall and stop, and now you can pass through walls. Will you fail the level if Baba is the one to touch the flag? Turn your character into a crab instead. Each level offers deceptively simple solutions to your problem, and it's up to you to think of new, creative ways to solve them. 
In spite of its simplistic and adorable art style, I'd say this game does remind me a lot of Portal. And any game that reminds me of Portal, honestly, it's an excellent game in my book. The one problem I have with it is that sometimes the solution is not overtly obvious, which, for a puzzle game, makes sense. The problem is, I haven't gotten very far in this game, and I'm stuck, and I refuse to look up walkthroughs, but I'm still having fun with the game, so I can't complain too much. I consider Handsome Jack to be one of, if not the greatest, villains in video games. He's charismatic, relatable, and just plain fun, and taking down his empire of capitalism and robots feels rewarding. Borderlands 3 feels like they wanted to capture that same feeling, but fell short in a way that's still just a blast to play. The combat in the game has received some much needed adjustments and improvements, like being able to vault over obstacles and little tweaks to gunplay but it still retains what makes Borderlands fun. Most of the characters are well written, there's lots of the franchise's guns and unique brand of humor, and the new cast of playable vault hunters have fun abilities and personalities. But this game's bigger draws, like the new worlds to explore and the main villains, they don't really feel up to snuff, and more feel like they're added to into the game to justify the long wait from Borderlands 2, rather than actually being a well thought out decision as to the direction the game was supposed to head. In general though, I enjoy the game. I just find myself pining more for Borderlands 2 than return wanting to return to this one. I'll probably play it again at some point, but I don't think it'll ever really top Borderlands 2 in my mind. It's still a fantastic game, and if you're a huge fan of Borderlands, by all means, give it a look. It's just not the one for me. To date, I must have played through Castle Crashers no less than 15 times. The gameplay is addictively simple, with a wide range of characters to play through once you've beaten the game, even just once. The combat is very simple and fun to play with, especially if you have a few friends in tow, and in general, it's one of the main draws of the experience. As far as remakes go, it's probably the least impressive out of the bunch from this past year, but even then, I'd rank it as one of, if not the best remakes of the year. The big draw for me this time was experiencing some of the newer stuff that the game included, like the new minigame Back Off Barbarian. It's a simple little game of keep away that I initially avoided when I got the Xbox One version of the game, but I must have spent hours playing it on the PlayStation 4, largely to get a trophy. Honestly, in general, I think I just appreciated the whole package of this game this time around a lot more, and hopefully soon I can wrangle three friends together and play through the campaign with them like when I first played through the game back in 2005. A good little dose of nostalgia and having a fun night with friends, maybe with a little alcohol involved, we'll see, could honestly just be the sort of thing we need. I like to keep my eye on the indie scene in gaming, and often I'm surprised at just how much a game can affect me. Concrete Genie has you play as Ash, a young artist who's bullied for his artistic visions by some local kids. With the help of his drawings and a magic paintbrush, Ash goes on a journey to help revitalize the harbor town he lives in, and you get to help him do that by crafting the artwork you plaster all over the town. From a gameplay standpoint, you can easily just plaster the walls with the same stuff over and over again to achieve your goal, you know, get the rack up the points or whatever. But the joy that you can have just from painting or even just playing the game is creating fun, vibrant works using the tools provided and letting your genies, these little creatures you create with your paintings, explore and experience them. This game makes me feel young again, when I would just draw whatever came to mind because I thought it was neat, and the inclusion of a PlayStation VR mode helps bring that feeling to life even more viscerally than the main game itself. It also features a touching story that I won't spoil here, so check it out for yourself. If you're looking for a fun PlayStation exclusive indie game and maybe need something to help bolster a PlayStation VR library, definitely give it a look. I have some seriously conflicted feelings about Nitro Fuel. On the one hand, the game plays fantastically. The controls just feel like the original, and within minutes of my first race, I was power sliding and taking shortcuts I hadn't gone through in over a decade as if I had played the game every day since. The inclusion of racers and tracks from Crash Nitro Kart, the, in my opinion, honestly inferior sequel on the PlayStation 2, 
was a welcome surprise addition, and the fact that they keep adding more racers and tracks is even more wonderful. The problem is the customization of the game. I was all for the idea of having custom cosmetics for carts and racers and all that stuff, but Activision just couldn't leave well enough alone, now could they? At first, my complaints were levied against the slow currency buildup, combined with poor online connectivity for online races, the fastest way to earn said currency. But then, after they initially promised they wouldn't, Activision went ahead and further reduced the rate at which you can unlock the currency and implemented, you guessed it, microtransactions. I just wanted a fun remake of one of my favorite games that lets me unlock something more, but instead, now I'm inundated with reminders that I can have a little bit more than I already have, and all I need to do is either play an ungodly amount of the game, or spend a few extra dollars so I can race as Spyro the Dragon. The game is still a hell of a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. I just hate to see this sort of thing happen to a game that I absolutely love. And what's worse, this isn't just another Call of Duty or Overwatch or something for Activision Blizzard to tack on microtransactions to. This is a game that is largely levied and marketed towards kids. How is this okay? I really wanted to like Death Stranding more than I did. I, I, re I really did. When it was first announced and with some of the more subsequent showings, the mystery of the world within intrigued me to no end. The game looks incredible and it has a lot of unique ideas, but something about the final product just keeps me from considering it a truly great game. I will say that I'm glad I ended up not picking it up, rather choosing to watch others play it online, but maybe I'm missing out on something, or the actual gameplay is the real reason people love it so much. I just ultimately think it's an odd game overall. Whether you want to talk about this as a glorified mailman simulator in the post-apocalypse, the blatant product placement, or the egregious cameos, there's a lot about this game that I just cannot get behind. But the world found within and the mystery that it holds kept me interested, and I'm glad that I stuck around until the end to see how it resolved. It's just, it's really not the game for me. I can understand why some people liked it and others didn't, and honestly, if it's your game, awesome! I just think I'll keep my expectations low for whatever Kojima releases next. Kingdom Hearts 3 feels like the conclusion I kind of figured it would be. Confusing, yet somehow satisfying. In general, I have some problems with the overall ending that might be answered in the Remind DLC, but I say that I enjoyed KH3. The game looks better than the series has ever looked thanks to the Unreal Engine, and the gameplay is as tight and flashy and over the top as ever thanks to the keyform changes, the attraction attacks, and everything in between. The Gummy Ship probably got the biggest improvement that I enjoyed, and I spent a whole lot of time just coasting through space fighting Heartless ships and customizing an endless fleet of them. But the lack of importance for the Disney worlds to the overall plot, something that hasn't really changed much over the course of the entire series that is, the uncomfortably easy difficulty, and the fact that the game offloads most of the important story for the final fourth of the game, just makes the experience feel like a needless grind so you can get to what the game is meant to be. A finale! Overall, the game looks and plays great. I'm glad the game at least acknowledged the weird and convoluted journey it's taken to get to this point. And if you're a fan, I say play the game. It's a conclusion to what we've been waiting for for over 15 years. But if this would be your first Kingdom Hearts game, uh, the combat's kind of fun. You can make Olaf swole, which is kind of neat. But uh, other than that, I, 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 I don't know. Proceed with caution, I guess. The latest entry in the Mortal Kombat franchise, Mortal Kombat 11 caters hard to the competitive scene. With subtle yet welcome adjustments to the combat system they've slowly been perfecting over the last few years. But the game also cripples itself with one of Netherrealm's weakest stories thus far, a needless grind for cosmetics through a randomized crypt, and at times it feels like they're trying to make this more like Mortal Kombat Mobile rather than the latest entry in the acclaimed series. But Mortal Kombat doesn't really need any flashy new modes or a good story or anything like that. What it needs is solid fighting mechanics, and in that regard, the game certainly succeeds. 
The new inclusions to the rosters are nice, but I found myself drifting more towards old favorites, all of whom felt like the best versions of themselves in a lot of different ways. In general, the fighting is some of the best the franchise has ever offered, and if you can just tighten up the story a little bit and maybe return the crypt to a not randomized state for the eventual sequel, I'll probably come back ready for another round. Or at least I'll come back once Spawn is released. I'm, I'm honestly just waiting for that at this point so I can have a Spawn vs. Scorpion match to see who really throws the best chain spears. I think it'll be fun. Building a dream zoo is one of those fantasies I never really knew I had until I first played the original Zoo Tycoon. Simply building a profitable zoo with a whole host of animals was fun, and the inclusion of aquatic life and dinosaurs and its expansions made for even more fun to be had. So when the people behind Planet Coaster announced Planet Zoo, I was intrigued. The game does exactly what it needs to do. Players drop into either a curated experience of helping pre-built zoos with their problems or into a sandbox mode to create the zoo of your dreams. Where the game excels is in the crafting and design of the enclosures themselves. With a bevy of tools and placeable objects, you can attend to the many needs of your animals while still making eye-catching displays for the guests. The rest of the experience, however, doesn't quite feel up to snuff with buildings being limited to the really restrictive path system making things feel more cramped than they really need to be. As far as crafting my perfect zoo goes, I'm still working to get it just right, but with the limited tools for the guest side of things hindering me a little bit, it might take a little bit longer than I would have hoped. But hey, maybe they can add in an aquatic thing and they already have that Jurassic Park game that they can probably implement something into this one. If they can just make it more like the original Zoo Tycoon in a lot of different ways, I'd probably consider it one of the best games out there. At times I feel like I'm one of the only people who really loves the Garden Warfare series of Plants vs. Zombies spin-off games, so when they made the surprise announcement and nearly same day release of Battle for Neighborville, I was appropriately surprised and pleased. Retaining much of what made me like the Garden Warfare titles in the first place, a variety of heroes on either side, optional co-op missions, well-crafted game modes, and that sort of thing, Battle for Neighborville adds a few new things to the formula. Instead of just competitive multiplayer modes or co-op horde-style gameplay, Battle for Neighborville adds a few open-world story missions that can be played by yourself or with a few friends. These areas let you play each of the different classes as much or as little as you like, leveling them up in an environment that lets you go at your own pace rather than adjusting to the horrors of online multiplayer. When you're ready to drop back into the online mayhem though, it's as easy as ever, and the game just oozes with fun from every angle. I've spent a lot of time with this game already, and I'll probably spend a lot more time going forward. Partly because the game is just fun, addictive, offers a lot of different modes, and there's actually seasonal events as well now but also because there's one trophy left for me to get the platinum trophy on this one and it requires me to spend an ungodly amount of time playing it, but at least the game's fun, so I can't really fault it for that. I absolutely adored my time with Pokemon Sword and Shield, to the point that I played through both games despite them having largely the same story, and I intend to play through them yet again, but I'm gonna do a Nuzlocke around this time, so, you know, there's at least some differences. This might have been one of the easiest Pokemon games in terms of difficulty, but it still offered a fun world to explore, plenty of unique, fun Pokemon, and gave us one of the best features added to a Pokemon game that I spent way more time in than I probably should have in the form of the wild area. Now, the game is not perfect, and in fact, it does have a few flaws. Things like a lack of global trade network or the aforementioned difficulty curve are legitimate complaints I could levy against this game. But those are the things that people aren't focusing on. Instead, we have pointless arguments about animation quality or the lack of the full 900 plus Pokedex to deal with. I'm just... I'm just so tired of Nintendo fandom. I can't take it. I don't want to get into that here though. So just know that the problems I have with this game are minimal, but they're not also keeping me from enjoying the game. Honestly, if anything, they make me appreciate it just that little bit more. Nintendo and Game Freak went out of their way to try and make an experience that's open to just about as many people as possible. 
I can honestly chalk up the difficulty curve to just my years of experience with the game, and the simple fact that we're going to be getting more content without having to purchase a full-priced new game? I'm all for it. Give me more of it. I want to play more. Sea of Solitude caught my attention the first time I saw it for two main reasons. It's a game developed under EA's Originals program that brought us games like Unravel and A Way Out prior to this, and the art style looked unique and eye-catching from the very first reveal trailer. When I finally got my hands on it, I was surprised by the level of complex emotional beats the game would hit, and how powerful a message it could deliver. The controls feel a little clunky at first, but that only helps to contribute, I feel, to the feelings of depression and hope that permeate through the game. As the world around you shifts and changes with the moods of the characters, you slowly unravel the story of a family broken apart by neglect, divorce, and self-doubt, with Kay at the center of the conflict trying her best to fix everything. This is a game that if, like me, you have a history of depression, self-doubt, or any of that, you can empathize with Kay's journey to a startling degree. If not, maybe you'll be able to empathize better with those of us who do. In general, I feel that video games are the best medium to tell stories like this. It lets people experience something that they maybe don't experience in their everyday life. And the way that Sea of Solitude executes on its premise, I cannot encourage you to play this game enough. It is a beautiful, well-written experience that, if nothing else, can be a great catharsis for those who maybe need a little bit of a break. Its design is well executed, its story is wonderfully told, and honestly if it weren't for the random collectibles that are strewn about, one of which makes some sense for the story and the other one is just kind of there, I would probably consider this one of the best enclosed experiences that you can possibly play. But those collectibles don't stop me from loving this game. It's easily one of the best games that has come out this generation, and I honestly feel that more people just, just need to have a chance to play it. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is probably the best game to come out this year that I did not play. Look, I'm not a huge fan of From Software games that aren't Bloodborne, so Sekiro wasn't one that I paid too much attention to when it first came out, or really much after that. But after recently watching a few streams and let's plays of the game, I decided it's one of those games that I could probably pick up at some point and enjoy, even if it's a From Software title. The combat looks like it's as tight as any other Dark Souls types game. But like any other Dark Souls or Bloodborne or anything like that, I'm more invested in the atmosphere and the world the game inhabits. Sekiro's world is wildly unique from its brethren. The fact that it has a story for once is actually kind of a neat twist. And I feel like that makes the game all the more impressive for me since, like I said, it's just Dark Souls. But with ninjas. The grappling hook adds a whole other level of complexity to the encounters, and if not for the fact that it has apparently really random difficulty spikes, I'd probably still rank this above Bloodborne. Although nothing really beats Bloodborne for me. Bloodborne is just fantastic, and I will be one of the first people in line if they ever announce Bloodborne 2. Either way, I think Sekiro more than deserved Game of the Year at the Game Awards this year, and kudos to you guys at From Software. Just keep making great games. The Outer Worlds is everything that I wanted Borderlands 3 to be. It's what I wish modern day Fallout games were like, and it contains within one of the best video game characters in gaming. It's witty, imaginative, full of other adjectives that describe how good it is, and I don't think I've had as much fun with a dialogue heavy RPG with sorta of clunky fighting mechanics before this. With everything from hacking to dialogue options streamlined down to having the right parts or the right number for your stats, the game blows by you as you explore your, at your own pace, encounter the various worlds full of fun characters, and just have a blast living it up as a communist taking down the capitalistic spacelands. This is now one of the definitive RPGs in my mind, right alongside Mass Effect, Baldur's Gate, Deus Ex, and the original, not Bethesda-led Fallout games. It's an absolutely wonderful game that I hope everyone has a chance to play. If you haven't played it yet, 
and you're a fan of this type of game, please give it a look. I just want more attention brought to this so that the people at Obsidian can have a chance to make even more of this unique, fun, creative world that I have just unabashedly loved exploring. Untitled Goose Game is one of the best f***ing games I've ever played. Its simple premise of you being a goose who ruins the day of everyone in a small English village is adorably cynical, and I was smiling for pretty much the entire time I played through this game, both on Nintendo Switch and the PlayStation 4 multiple times through. I legitimately have like nothing bad to say about this, except that I wish it had been a little bit longer. Three to four hours of content is great, especially for as small of a team that's over at House House. But maybe that leaves room for potential DLC, where we can go from this small village into, say, London, waltz right up to the queen herself and steal the crown, you know? I I've actually written a full concept for this house house. Get in contact with me. We, we can hopefully make this happen together. Either way, as far as indie games go, this is one of the absolute best games available. If you have a Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox, whatever console, by all means, enjoy your time playing Untitled Goose Game. I have been playing World of Warcraft on and off since the game first released, and I've enjoyed many improvements and additions to the game that have been added over the years. But I already talked a little bit about that when I talked about Battle for Azeroth last year in my Best Games of 2018 video, so we're just gonna move on. But then Blizzard announced they'd be releasing official legacy servers that brought the game to a state reminiscent of how it was back in 2005. I was eager to relive a game that had been lost to time, and oh boy am I glad it's not a separate subscription because I've mostly had my fill with this already. Classic is, at its core, a great way to experience a game that has iterated and involved a lot over the last 15 years. Having a chance to experience character builds and locations in their original form makes me better appreciate some of the improvements that have helped these classes feel more fleshed out helped the world expand and helped make this game what it is, all while giving me a chance to explore Azeroth for the first time in years the same way I explored it when I was so much younger. My favorite part of this whole ordeal though was people complaining about bugs when Classic launched, only for Blizzard to just sigh and be like, that's not a bug, it was a feature. It just, it, it gave me a really good laugh as I played my way to level 60. In general though, I'm really glad that they didn't decide to say there's a separate subscription for this. But the fact that I can just go in and play whenever I get that nostalgia itch now, it feels nice to know that I have that option. And there you go. 18 games from 2019 that I enjoyed to at least some degree or had something to say about. I know there were some games that didn't make this list here that might have been on your list but I either didn't play them, haven't played enough of them to really have an opinion on the game, or just found these other games more enjoyable. That said, I would love to hear what your favorite games are in the comments. Let me know what some of the games are that you played this year that you loved and why, whether they're on this list or the ones that I didn't include or whatever, and hey, it'll just mean that we all have more games that we can have a chance to play. But. I'm going to go for now. I have another 18 videos I want to make, and I have like no time to really work on them. So I'm going to go take care of that. Thank you for watching, and let's all have a great 2020.